Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first class of the Youth Aviation Education Program, which is uh, put on by Checkride Prep. I hope everyone had a great week, is enjoying their weekend, and uh, I'm happy to see everyone here. So uh, it's going to be a fun time. We are going to be splitting up this course into 33 separate weeks uh, and 33 different lessons. And in addition to that, we do have some guest speakers every single month. So those are going to include, uh, we have astronauts and aeronautical engineers, so you can ask any specific questions about career opportunities. Uh, we also have pilots uh, and also mechanics and a wide kind of variety or range of uh, different types of professions that we'll be speaking to as well. So welcome uh, to the students on the first class. Also welcome to the parents and the leaders. We're happy to have you here. I'm glad that you are uh, going to be participating in this course. So just like uh, just like we normally do, we're going to kind of get into the material today. We're going to do a discussion or introduction to aerodynamics. We're going to talk about what makes an aircraft fly. Uh, in addition to that, we'll be talking about the components of an airplane. So uh, things such as the uh, rudder and the ailerons and those types of things. Um, but before we get started, we'll talk a little bit about of an intro. I'll let you know who I am. I kind of want to know about yourself as well. Um, and uh, that's how we're going to kind of proceed. So for those of you that have never taken one of our courses, welcome. Uh, my name is David Tushin. Uh, I am, uh, I, I am going to be your instructor for over the next uh, academic year of 33 weeks. So I uh, look forward to uh, meeting everyone, getting to know uh, both uh, the youth and also the parents and the cadets out there. Um, so I actually started flying back in 2001 uh, and I uh, ended up uh, taking a little bit of a hiatus or a break there, and I kind of came back into the industry in 2016, 2017, got all my licenses, became a certified flight instructor, uh, and then uh, very shortly afterwards, ended up at the airlines flying the Ember Air 175. So I was based out of uh, Los Angeles International. Uh, I flew for Compass Airlines, both on the Delta and the American side. So I'm familiar with international flights, and we basically used to fly out of LAX and kind of just do we call them round robins, which is basically uh, one leg and back. We always basically terminated the flight at LAX, uh, and then we usually had overnights uh, elsewhere. But we flew in Mexico, Canada. Pretty much our furthest flight was uh, all the way out to uh, the Nashville area for uh, maintenance flights or maintenance runs, that is. Other than that, I am an FAA Gold Seal instructor, and I've uh, been uh, kind of had the pleasure, um, you know, of teaching a lot of students online this year. So it's been a great experience, and we want to kind of continue that tradition with uh, this group. Uh, and we're looking forward to kind of seeing everybody progress. We'll talk a little bit about how the course is designed, and there is a quiz uh, for every single lesson. It's basically a 10-question quiz, so you just need an 80% or higher to pass it. And uh, as long as you participate, uh, it's going to be fairly easy, okay? So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about yourself. So now that you guys know about me and, you know, um, I was not in Civil Air Patrol when I was a young kid. I was actually in the Boy Scouts. We didn't have Civil Air Patrol. Kind of grew up in the Seattle area. Um, participate a little bit in EAA as well. So um, kind of want to know from the group here, I'm going to play a short video from Swain Martin uh, in terms of why he loves to fly. Uh, he is a 23-year-old, uh, but he started flying, and he got he became, I think he got his solo in, when he was 16, went to the University of North Dakota, uh, ended up flying for Mokalele Airlines, and now he flies at a regional called uh, Envoy for American Airlines. He produces a lot of videos, and I, I did receive his permission to play this video. But a couple things that I want to know from everybody here is why is you know why did you choose aviation or even if you're not if you're not really sure about aviation is it something that interests you uh what interests you about that where are you guys and gals located out there what goals do you have is it is it aviation related is it to get your pilot's license uh is this something that's just for fun or recreation or is this something that you have potentially uh thought about doing for a long period of time and if anybody out there started uh flight training by all means, throw that in the chat too. Uh, we want to obviously learn about each other. We're gonna spend a lot of time together over the next uh, school year here. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce uh, Swain Martin's video, and it's basically why you should get your license. And uh, he's pretty inspirational. For those that don't know, you can follow him on YouTube under Swain Martin. We'll put the uh, link at the very top. But uh, go ahead and feel free to answer those questions while the video is playing and let us know a little bit about you uh, before we proceed with the rest of the class. All right, I'll see everybody in just a moment.
All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing in the chat, learning a little bit about uh, everyone here. We've got folks wanting to join the Air Force. We have folks in Civil Air Patrol, EAA, homeschool, and uh, looks like we've got a sprinkling of everybody kind of around the country, Florida, California, Virginia. 
uh, Ohio, uh, Seattle area. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, glad to have you here. We also have Texas as well. So but thanks again for sharing. As I mentioned, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how this course is designed before we actually get into the aerodynamics today. And usually the way that our courses are designed is as, as you guys know at this point, we have a class every Saturday at 4 p.m. Pacific uh, or 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast time, depending on where you live in the country. And they are designed to last an hour with a 30 minute Q&A. And in this case, we're probably gonna go a few minutes over just because we have a little bit of extra content to cover today with everyone. Um, we do take breaks for holidays and those types of things. We will send out a syllabus uh, over the weekend for the upcoming classes and the courses uh, to let you guys know exactly what uh, to expect as you move forward. Now, a couple things we do want to point out with the private pilot program is we want to talk about the differences between ground school and flight lessons. Uh, we are teaching you the ground school portion of your actual uh, knowledge base, right? This is all of your aviation theory. This is uh, all the things in terms of how does an airplane fly? We're also going to talk about aircraft flight instruments and how they actually work uh, and how to read them, more importantly. We'll also talk about airport operations. We've got a couple of classes on that. We'll talk about uh, navigation, uh, how to actually navigate an airplane from point A to point B, and there's a few different methods that we use. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot about safety, um, and we're gonna be tying all that stuff together over the next 33 weeks. So uh, the way that that differs for flight lessons is when you get into the cockpit of an airplane, um, they're not really spending the time on the theory. The flight lessons are there to basically make sure that you can take off and land, you can talk on the radios. That's more of the practical side of things, although we do cover some practical uh, components as well. If you're unable to make any classes, we do record every single class and they are posted shortly on our website. Um, make sure that you are enrolled on our website. It's www.checkride-prep.com uh, and uh, if you're signed up, you should be already in the ed youth education program. Uh, homework and reading, uh, inside of every single lesson, you'll find next week's homework and the reading, uh, or at least the supplement for the reading that is available to you so you can stay ahead of it. Um, we're not trying to give you a lot of stuff to do. We're just trying to uh, give you maybe five or 10 pages to read during the week. Uh, and then after every class, you can finish it at any point in time. There is a, a 10 question quiz. You just need to get an 80% or higher and you have the ability to take the quiz as many times as you need to. Every time you take the quiz though, it kind of jumbles the questions or kind of uh, randomizes the questions just so it makes it a little bit more challenging as well. The goal at the end of this class uh, is, is really to get you that FAA written test endorsement. And at the very end of the class, what we're gonna do is we are going to simulate a final exam and that final exam will be 60 questions over a two and a half hour period. So most people finish it in about an hour, uh, but you do have up to two and a half hours. And um, that basically mimics or is exactly like the FAA uh, written exam as, as uh, we know here, okay? Course materials, there are some course materials and uh, these are, the, the book is recommended, it's actually highly recommended, but at the same time, the map and the plotter and the E6B, which is this weird little calculator thing here in the center bottom part of the screen, uh, these are all, we're gonna need those at least probably by the 80% mark of the class when we start covering navigation. Uh, this class is modeled off of Rod Machado's private pilot handbook. Uh, so this handbook uh, is the one that we recommend. Any edition works, uh, whether it's used or new. Um, we're currently using the third edition. I think on my desk right now, I have the second edition, the hardcover one. Um, and it's the reason why we usually use Rod Machado's books uh, for both our private pilot and our instrument pilot courses is that all the authors at the end of the day, we all teach the same material, right? Um, no matter what, the content is, is exactly the same, but it's the way that it's written and it's the way that it's delivered or explained. And uh, the way that Rod sets up his book and, and puts all the information together, he makes it very easy to digest. So it is something that I would recommend, but it, once again, it's not required. In addition to that, sort of towards the 80% mark, this is gonna be next year. It's not required right this second, but uh, we will ask to get a specific FAA chart. Uh, there's a couple different FAA charts. They're just like uh, AAA guides or anything else like that. There are maps in the sky. 
and um, we will go ahead and let you know what those are as we get closer to that to that point. And if you're looking for any of these materials, you can go on our website and I believe there's a start here or welcome uh, button on the upper left hand corner. We have a list of all of the materials and a couple of uh, recommendations for some of the larger nationwide pilot, pilot shops out there as well. In addition to that, we have the aviation plotter. Uh, the aviation plotter is this thing right here. This is what we call a fixed plotter. There is another version of this. Uh, it's called a movable plotter. The movable plotter uh, is exactly the same thing, except this thing actually moves around in a circle. This is how we actually measure on a map. In addition to that, this is how we figure out what is known as a true course. We'll get into that towards uh, our two thirds mark or 80% mark. And then the final one is gonna be your E6B. So your E6B comes in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Some are smaller and some are larger. Uh, this is one made by Jepson. They're usually about $8 a piece. There's two different sides. There's a wind side on the back and then there's a flight computer side on the front of it. This is how we do our time, fuel and distance calculations. Uh, this one happens to be made out of paper, but I've had this since 2001. There's other ones that are made out of plastic, and there's also some that are actually made out of metal as well. Uh, so choose the one that's best for you. And as mentioned, we are not going to be required to have this until you're a little bit further along at that point. But just want to let you know what some of those course materials are. Okay. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is going to be the private pilot requirements. And we'll get into that here in just a second. And Jacob said, we, when would we roughly take the exam? Uh, we are looking at a completion date of June and we will have that finalized um, calendar for you. So you can plan ahead uh, and we'll send that out over the weekend or over the next couple of days. And that's kind of the goal at the end of the day. OK, just because you're taking this class does not mean you cannot hop in an airplane. If you are if you want to start training, you can absolutely do so. Um, some students will wait until the course is done, and then some students will do it in conjunction or at the same time of their ground training. In order to get the FAA private pilot certificate, there's a couple requirements that the government tells us about. So I'll just kind of uh, review them here quickly for you. You need to be at least 16 years old to fly by yourself. Uh, so that's what we call soloing, uh, but you need to be 17 years of age in order to get your actual FAA license, okay? You have to be able to read, write, and converse fluently in English. Uh, if, if, that, if English is your second language, there are courses, aviation specific courses, or what we call aviation English courses that are out there um, that can uh, basically assist you with that. You need to obtain a minimum of a third class FAA medical certificate. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the future here. But uh, in order to get an FAA medical certificate, you have to visit what is known as an aviation medical examiner. We call those an AME. And that is going to be the key. Um, it's just like any other medical test. They'll have you fill out some questionnaires and ask you some questions. You'll do a short evaluation uh, and then hopefully you'll get that third class medical certificate. In addition to that, you're going to go ahead and receive and log ground training from an authorized instructor. So I am going to be your authorized instructor during during this year. Uh, and in addition to that, the, that's basically the purpose of this course. You have to pass an FAA knowledge test with a 70 percent or higher. Uh, you need to accumulate uh, the appropriate flight experience. Uh, so we'll be talking about what exactly you need to do in the airplane. Uh, but keep in mind, the minimum number of hours is going to be 40 hours inside of the aircraft, uh, although sometimes it can be a little bit higher depending on uh, how you progress with, with your instructor and so forth. And then the finally, what ends up happening is once you've met all the requirements, you're going to go ahead and do your final practical exam. We call it a practical exam. There's two different parts to it. The first part is the oral, uh, and the oral is basically a Q&A that's a scenario-based and uh, basically a bunch of scenario-based questions. So why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why did you choose to fly over here? How do you talk on the radios? Those types of things. And then we have the practical component, which is gonna be hopping into the airplane and demonstrating the skills that you learn to that examiner. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit towards the very, very end of class. And then we will talk specifically about the private pilot practical test standards. We call that the PTS. Um, but at the end of the day, that is called your check ride. And that's how everything is going to sum it up. Uh, Jacob, I didn't do the math, but 42 out of 60 sounds pretty good, but you want to score as high as possible. All right. 
So the private pilot flight requirements, the way that that 40 hours breaks down is the following. So these are the way that, uh, or this is the requirements that you need to meet. We'll start over here with the dual. So dual is basically going to be uh, 20 hours with an instructor. And these you have to do certain areas of operation. So those basically include three hours of cross country flight time in the airplane. Now, anytime we talk about cross country, we're not talking about flying from LA to New York or Texas to New York or very, very far. That's just 50 miles away from your home airport. In addition to that, you need three hours of night flight training. You'll also need a cross country of 100 nautical miles with 10 takeoff and landings. We usually do that with our instructor as well. Uh, we need three hours of flight training by reference to instruments. So what they do is they put you under what we call a hood or foggles, and that basically prevents you from looking outside. You can only see your flight instruments and you'll be basically flying using just those flight instruments themselves. In addition to that, we also have the three hours of flight training within the 60 days when you're ready to take the practical test. So that's kind of the key to that one right there. And then 10 hours uh, at minimum for solo time. So with the solo, you have a number of things that uh, is broken down. So you're gonna have to fly by yourself uh, in that airplane for five hours uh, doing cross countries. Uh, you'll have a, a longer cross country of 150 nautical miles at three different airports. And you're gonna have to land at each one of those airports. You'll have to do, uh, in addition to that, you'll have an, another five hours of flight time that you need to do. And keep in mind that while 40 hours of flight time is the minimum, the national average is 65. Everybody's different in terms of how they pick up the skills uh, and progress along, okay? Now, the other one that you might wanna do, and you can do this uh, locally, is you can sign up for your FAA student pilot's license. Um, as of 2016, uh, you actually need to get a card that just looks like this. You can navigate to this website, it's called iacra.faa.gov. Uh, you need to be at least 16 years of age uh, if you're gonna be flying an aircraft or 14 years of age if you have any intention on flying a glider or a balloon. And uh, what ends up happening is you're gonna go ahead and fill out an application, it's completely free. You need either a FAA safety inspector or a certified flight instructor to review the information uh, basically verify your identity or using your government issued ID. And then once they approve it, they'll go ahead and send you one of these plastic cards in the mail. Um, and really the only requirements are the age requirement and that you read, speak and understand English. So all of these things are just kind of preparing you for when you're ready to solo. You don't need a student pilot license until you solo, nor do you need the medical until you solo. But um, as with anything with medicals, I recommend getting them out of the way earlier rather than later. Um, if there's any issues that you need to address medically uh, or get a special waiver for something, uh, now would be the time uh, before you kind of proceed. Uh, balloon, yep, exactly, like a hot air balloon. So you can be a little bit younger if you fly a, a hot air balloon or a glider, exactly. All right, that IACRA website, if you navigate to there, and keep in mind, you don't need to write down all of these different uh, websites. These are all located in lesson number one. So anytime that we talk about a specific website or we have a handout or anything along those lines that we're gonna be using for that class, you will have access to that um, on the day that it becomes available. We will open up our courses. Every single course basically will open on the Saturday that we're gonna be doing the course. So you'll have access to all the same information that we're providing to you. In order to do it, you would navigate to this site. It looks just like this. This is how we actually uh, request an FAA license. Uh, for those of you that are new to this site, which is probably most of you, you're gonna click on that register button in the upper right-hand corner. It will ask you a series of questions. Just go ahead and fill it out. If you need your parents' help, you can do so as well. Um, and then once you're done with that, you'll go ahead and then uh, basically start a new application. The application is for a student pilot license. We have exact uh, instructions located on lesson one for those parents out there. Uh, and then you can go down to your local flight school, talk about, uh, talk with someone and uh, effectively uh, be able to get that signed off as you move forward, all right? Now, looking at the next thing that we wanna talk about is there are several other licenses and ratings in aviation. And what we're gonna be talking about is this is just like the quick overview. There are several other uh, licenses that you could potentially get. 
Um, there is something called a sport pilot license, which is one. There's a recreational pilot license, but the there are far more private pilots. There's over a half a million private pilots in the United States. I think we're at 600,000 plus at this point. And the private pilot is kind of the class that we're going to be teaching for. Um, although you can use the same information if, if you become interested in helicopters, you can use the same information if you become interested in gliders. I don't think hot air balloons are going to work in this case, but um, some of the general uh, air traffic and the airspace and how to read maps will be basically the same, no matter what your intentions are. Once you get a private pilot license, the private pilot license allows you to actually fly by yourself as long as you're not getting paid for it. So you can't get paid or compensated for your time until you become a commercial pilot, which is the green one over here. And this allows you to fly all across the United States whenever you want, day or night. Um, you can even fly internationally if you want as well uh, with another uh, add-on, if you, if you wanna call it that. It's a radio license that we need in our possession. And with that private pilot license, we are basically uh, flying by reference to the Earth surface. So that means that we can't fly into clouds and in order to fly into clouds, our next step would be the instrument ratings. The instrument rating gets attached to our private pilot license. And when we do those types of things, uh, this rating allows us to now fly in and out of the clouds. Um, and this is actually how pretty much actually all 100% of air traffic basically for commercial, all the big airliners out there, Delta, Southwest and so forth, uh, they always fly, basically fly using their instruments, even if it's clear or if they're flying through the clouds. The next one is your commercial license. Your commercial license is there to help you get paid. So um, once you have your commercial license, this actually allows you to get paid as a pilot. You can't accept compensation uh, or be hired by anyone until you actually get your commercial license. And from that point, it's really up to you where you wanna go. There's a lot of different avenues. Some people will become a flight instructor. So that's one option. If you enjoy teaching uh, other people, then you can become a flight instructor. Uh, the other avenues that I did not put on here are you could actually go and work for, you know, dropping skydivers. You could do pipeline patrol, uh, electricity patrol lines. You can do um, search and rescue operations. You can uh, fly business jets. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Um, in order to get to the airline transport license, that's 1,500 hours of flight time. And uh, the ATP license is kind of, that's what allows you to fly a lot of those very, very large airplanes like the 747s and the Airbus A318s and the 320s and so forth. So um, this is the license that all airline pilots have. Uh, so if you're gonna fly just a business jet, you can actually usually stop at the commercial, commercial level uh, which is 250 hours versus the 1500 hours, okay? If you have more questions about it, remember we're gonna stick around after every single class. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, so that's what we're gonna go ahead and talk about as well. All right, so we're, first thing we're gonna talk about for today, um, and like I said, we're gonna keep every lesson to roughly about an hour. This one's gonna be a little bit longer just because we needed to do the introduction or the introductory material. Um, today, we're gonna initially start off with aircraft components, and then we're gonna talk about the four forces. Uh, we're gonna talk about three other things in aerodynamics, which is Newton's law, Bernoulli's principle, and the four forces of flight. Um, but let's first talk about aircraft components. And there's typically gonna be five different things that make up an airplane. It doesn't matter if it's a small airplane like this, this is what we call a general aviation aircraft is usually what it will be. Um, general aviation is kind of the non-commercial side of things and, and that's what makes up quite a bit of uh, trainers as well. Um, but if you were to look at the largest airplanes like the big 747s, it's still the same components. So starting off, the, the, the biggest and most obvious ones are gonna be the wing, right? The wing is the thing that's actually what makes us fly. Uh, so that's where it holds our fuel. That also holds controls that basically allow us to turn right and left. So we'll look at those here in a little bit. Where all of the occupants and baggage uh, basically reside are going to be in this yellow section. We call this the fuselage. So this is everything from the cockpit to the passengers to the baggage. And then there's even some empty areas in back towards the tail. 
The big thing in the back is the empennage, and the empennage is actually made up of several different components. So the empennage, if we look at the component that is horizontal here, this is called the horizontal stabilizer. The horizontal stabilizer is just that. It is actually horizontal, so it basically moves like that. And attached to that horizontal stabilizer is the elevator, and that will allow us to either climb or descend. The empennage is the tall one there. We call that the vertical stabilizer and attached to the, I'm sorry, the vertical stabilizer is the one that goes up and down there. Uh, and attached to that is actually the rudders. And this whole unit, the vertical and horizontal stabilizer is known as the empennage. You're gonna notice a lot of these words that we look at like empennage, these are French uh, because uh, that's, that's where a lot of the stuff was derived from, okay? And the trim, exactly, Jacob. Uh, then we have the power plant. So the power plant is going to be in, in this case, it's the front of the airplane. Uh, in the larger airplanes, obviously, you might have more than one power plant or uh, thrust, depending on what you're flying. Uh, for, for most of us, it's going to be in the very, very front of the aircraft and not attached to the wings. And then finally, we actually have the landing gear itself. So the landing gear, there's a couple different varieties that you're going to see. Um, usually, they're going to be either fixed gear uh, that allow you to land on actual pavement. Uh, you could also have retractable gear, meaning that once you take off, you, these will actually tuck into the body of the aircraft. Um, and then they also make ones for seaplanes as well. So you can land on the water and take off on the water and then also potentially take off or land uh, on hard surface as well. So what we're going to be doing is let's go ahead and look at the, a larger plane and show you a little bit about the differences as well. Um, and the empennage, uh, Zachary, doesn't the empennage control some of the turning? So it does control some of the turning. Uh, the rudder system, the way that the rudder system works is that we actually control this device that's kind of hidden by the, behind that word. That is the rudder. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But that is you, we use our feet to control that rudder, okay? Now, when we're on the ground, that is actually mechanically linked to our landing gear, our nose gear. And you'll notice that the nose gear will actually turn right and left. But what ends up happening is that we basically have two different rods that are put together, and that is when the weight is on the wheels. And as we take off, it starts to separate, and then we have a strut that basically expands. And as that strut expands, when you start using the rudder pedals by your feet, it's only moving the rudder in the back of the plane and that nose wheel st stays basically perfectly straight. Once that actually starts to compress again, that strut starts to compress, those gears kind of interlock. And when you're using that rudder again, now you're gonna get the movement and the nose gear in that direction, okay? So hopefully that explains that. All right, let's look at that larger plane as well. Um, so looking at like a C-130 style aircraft, uh, these are basically the exact same thing, right? So the, we have the cockpit and the fuselage. The fuselage is making up all of that cargo area, basically along the length of that aircraft as shown there. And that does include the cockpit as well. Uh, we do have our power plants. In this case, we actually have four uh, power plants, probably turboprops in this circumstance. Could also be uh, jet engines, depending on how the aircraft is configured. We have the wing which you're gonna hear a lot, the wing is the thing. This is what allows us to fly. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, then we've got the empennage. So circled in green, this is the empennage. So as we said, this long horizontal part is called the horizontal stabilizer. And in the very, very back there, that is the elevator. That's what makes us go up or down. And then we also have the vertical stabilizer, the one that sticks straight up in the sky. On the very back of that, uh, that stabilizer is the rudder, and that basically allows us to yaw right or left, all right? So the way that this actually works, if we were to look at it, is let's look at how we actually control the aircraft using roll, pitch, and yaw, looking at those different types of control surfaces. So there's three different control surfaces that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about the ailerons, the elevator, and the rudder. So we'll look at each one individually, um, but if we were to look at it, there's several different axes to an airplane. So the longitudinal is the long axis. If you were to draw an imaginary line going straight through the airplane, that is what we call the longitudinal axis, basically from the spinner at the very front to the tip at the very back of that stabilizer. 
this what is basically what allows us to roll, basically roll right or left. And in this circumstance, you can see here, there's little tiny yellow sections here. Those are called ailerons. And ailerons allow us to move right or left or turn right or left. Now we control this using the actual yoke of the aircraft. So just like in a car, when we turn right and left, it does the same thing. Looking at pitch, pitch is on the lateral axis. So this is where if you were to basically draw a line just straight through the cockpit uh, or the fuselage in this case that basically matches the wings, the wingspan itself, this is what allows us to go up and down. And what controls the up and down is on the, on the horizontal stabilizer. There's these yellow, little tiny yellow things. This is the elevator, okay? So that's what allows us to go straight, basically climb or descend. The final one that people have a little bit more trouble kind of understanding is if you were to draw a line through the center of the airplane, basically going straight down, we call this the vertical axis. And the vertical axis basically allows us to yaw, okay? So this is controlled using the rudder. So these are the rudder pedals that are on the floor and we use our feet in order to control those rudder pedals. On the very, very back of that vertical stabilizer is the rudder and the rudder is usually a fairly large uh, surface or control surface, if you will. Um, and using a combination of these things, that's basically what allows us to manipulate the airplane and get it, we can basically climb and descend, we can make turns, we can stay coordinated and those types of things as well. Okay. Looking at each component individually, uh, the first one we're going to look at is the elevators. So remember, the elevators are on the lateral axis, and it has to do with pitch. So this allows us to go up and down. So if we were to look at this, on the very, very back of that horizontal stabilizer, it isn't the whole entire thing, but it's usually the last little section there, you're going to have your elevator. So your elevator, depending on how it's deflected in the wind, will basically allow us to raise the nose or lower the nose, okay? If you've ever stuck your hand out the window uh, of a moving car and basically kind of raised your hand up, you kind of catch a little bit of air. And if you kind of push, turn your hand slightly down, your hand seems to get smacked down towards the bottom of the window. It's kind of the same thing. So when we look at this, when we raise the elevator, it actually forces the tail down and the nose up in that first one right here. And in order to raise the elevator, I have to pull that yoke towards my chest. You pull it towards you in this case. If it's neutral, uh, meaning that we're not pushing or pulling on that yoke, the elevator will basically look exactly like this. Okay, so it'll be in that neutral or what we call trailing position. And then the final one is, is if we're trying to descend, uh, then this is the way that it would look, right? And this is us pushing that yoke towards, the, towards all those flight instruments or away from us. Uh, and this is gonna get that nose to go down, all right? So that's the first one, which is gonna be the elevator. The next one that we're gonna talk about is the ailerons, okay? So the ailerons allow us to roll, and we can't see them here, but underneath or in the back of both of these wings here, there's two different devices that basically go up or down into the wind. So just like you see here, you've got, uh, that is your aileron, and your aileron basically I uh, will either create additional lift or additional drag, and that's what will allow one wing to rise and one wing to uh, descend. Now, remember, this is on the longitudinal axis, basically from the front of the plane to the back of the plane, if you were to imagine that straight line going all the way through. And uh, the roll is controlled by the ailerons, and it's a rotation. So the trailing position is that neutral position, assuming that we, we didn't turn the yoke. As we turn the yoke, what will end up happening is that one, they, they move opposite directions. So if one aileron goes down on one side, the other aileron will actually go up on the opposite side, okay? So what will end up happening is, is as you have airflow going uh, over the wings, you'll have this one is creating more lift and this one is creating more drag. So the middle one is creating more lift, the, the opposite one at the bottom is actually creating more drag. And when you have more lift, one of the wings will raise. And if you have more drag, one of the wings will actually start to uh, descend a little bit. And that's what makes an airplane turn, okay? The final one that we've got is the rudder. So remember, this is basically drawing a line through the center part of uh, a vertical line through the center part of the cockpit or the fuselage there. 
and this is what we call uh, yaw. So yaw is not roll, it's just kind of moving the nose to the right or to the left, uh, but we're not actually physically moving the wings. So very hard to see here. We can obviously have a good view of the actual horizontal stabilizer, which is that long part there, but sitting on top of that horizontal stabilizer is the vertical stabilizer. And looking at a cross section of that vertical stabilizer, we have the rudder. So the rudder, we use our feet. And as we do it, if you move the rudder to the left, it forces the tail in the opposite direction, okay? If the neutral position, meaning our feet are off the rudders, it's basically gonna stick straight back uh, towards the back of the airplane. If we move the rudder to the right, it forces the tail to the left, okay? So this is on the vertical axis. All right, let's go ahead and continue. Um, a couple of things, we do have polls throughout this class just to make sure that everybody's paying attention and see if anybody has any problems. Once the poll opens, please answer your questions inside the poll. Uh, try not to answer them in the chat. That gives away the answer to everybody else. Uh, you're gonna see three different buttons when it becomes available. You'll see offer, poll, and file. Just click on the poll one in the center there uh, and I will let you know when it becomes available. Please, if you, if you really wanna, if you're lost, let us know and we'll help you out there, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and open the poll here. And the first question that I've got is, what is the purpose of the rudder on an airplane? Is it A, to control yaw, B, to control overbanking tendency, or C, to control roll? Give everyone a couple of seconds on this one. You knew what the elevator was called, Rain. Cool. Perfect. Uh, so Zachariah was asking on the ground, the wheel turns the whole aircraft. Uh, the way that the aircraft turns on the ground is we use our feet. We use the rudder pedals in order to turn right or left. In the largest airplanes, there's usually a little steering wheel that's a little bit separate. It's on the uh, captain's side of the aircraft. If you're talking about like the large Boeing or Airbus aircraft, um, that allows you to steer, steer a little bit more precisely than the rudder pedals themselves. Give everyone just another, got a couple more people answering right now. All right, perfect. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll right there. Great job, everybody. We've got 90% of the class with the correct answer. The correct answer is gonna be A, it is to control yaw, okay? So you can see the way that the FAA are gonna ask these questions is they're just going to replace the word. So in this case, if I replace the word with from rudder, I could basically say a number of other flight control surfaces that we talked about, and then those answers would be slightly differently. But the correct answer there is gonna be A, it is to control yaw. Great job, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. That is the first part, talking about how what the components of the aircraft are. But in this case, now we're going to move on and actually talk about three different things as we wrap up class today. We've got Newton's Law. So uh, some of you have probably studied this in science or physics class. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Bernoulli's principle, and then we'll get into the four forces of flight. And we will also kind of talk a little bit more about the four forces in next class as well, okay? So before we begin, I'm gonna show a short seven minute intro video on aerodynamics uh, so you can follow along. And then we're gonna go into a little bit more depth about how uh, an aircraft is actually able to fly. Um, so with that, I'll see you guys and gals here in a very, very short amount of time. So go ahead and sit back and enjoy. If you have ever flown on an airplane, you know that it's an enormous-sized, amazing machine. A typical 747 can carry more than 500 passengers and weighs around 800,000 pounds when taking off. Yet it rolls down the runway at a speed of 290 kilometers per hour and, as though by magic, lifts itself into the air and can travel up to 13,000 kilometers without stopping. Incredible, isn't it? Today. 
We are going to learn how an airplane flies in a very simple way by going through the aerodynamics of an airplane, the main parts of an airplane, and controlling the airplane. The aerodynamics of an airplane. The four aerodynamics of an airplane are drag, thrust, weight, and lift. Drag, also called air resistance, refers to the forces acting opposite to the relative motion of any object moving with respect to a surrounding fluid. The energy it takes to push through the surrounding fluid creates drag. You may have noticed an excellent example of drag reduction in track cycling. The cyclist must push through the mass of air in front, but a streamlined sitting posture that cuts through the air more smoothly enables a cyclist to travel much faster, with less effort. The airplane always retracts its landing gear and nose gear into the body of the plane after takeoff to reduce drag. Thrust counters drag. It is a mechanical force that keeps the airplane moving in the air. Thrust is generated by propellers, jet engines, or rockets. The compressor inside the jet engine takes the air and compresses it, and after processing from the combustion chamber and turbine, the gas is blown out through the exhaust nozzle. Here, Newton's third law of motion is applied where the gas is pushed backward and the engine is pushed forward. Weight is the airplane body, passenger, and luggage weight in total. Lift overcomes the weight and holds the airplane in the air. Lift is created mostly by wings to keep the plane aloft. So, to keep the airplane moving, flying straight and level, this must be true. Which means no net force acting upon an airplane. In any case, if drag is greater than thrust, the plane slows down. If thrust is greater than drag, the plane moves faster. If weight is greater than lift, the plane descends. If lift is greater than weight, the plane climbs. Parts of an airplane. The basic parts of an airplane are 1. Wings, 2. Horizontal stabilizer, and 3. Vertical stabilizer. The wing is the most important part of an airplane, since it produces lift that allows a plane to fly. A wing produces lift because of its slightly inclined and special shape, which is called an airfoil. This special shape is designed to deflect the air at the bottom of the wing due to more air strikes at the bottom and less air at the top of the wing. As the airplane rolls down the runway, higher pressure and more upward force produces below the wing and lower pressure and lesser downward force above the wing. The net result is the lifting of an airplane. Stabilizer. Stability in an airplane is a tendency to return to its initial state after a disturbance from that state. Horizontal stabilizer performs this function when the disturbance force causes the nose of an airplane to move up or down. Such movement is called pitch. Vertical stabilizer provides stability for a disturbance in yaw. Yaw is side-to-side -side motion of the nose. Controlling the airplane. So what are the components in an airplane which control the flight, direction, and height and maintain the equilibrium? It's elevator, rudder, and aileron. The elevator can be deflected up or down to produce a change in the downforce produced by the horizontal tail. If the elevator is deflected upward, it increases the downforce produced by the horizontal tail, causing the nose to pitch upward. If the elevator is deflected downward, then the counteracting force causes the nose to pitch down. The rudder can be deflected to either side to produce a change in the side force produced by the vertical tail. If the rudder is deflected towards the right, it creates a side force to the left which causes the nose to yaw to the right. If the rudder is deflected towards the left, it creates a side force to the right which causes the nose to yaw to the left. Ailerons are located on the tips of each wing. Ailerons can be used to generate a rolling motion for an aircraft. Ailerons usually work in opposition. If the right aileron is deflected upward, then left is deflected downward, and vice versa. Let's see this. To curve the flight path, the pilot deflects one wing to move up and the other wing to move down by controlling the ailerons. With the left aileron in downwards direction, the lift will increase. 
whereas at the same time the aileron of the right wing is in the upward position. Therefore, lift on the right wing is decreased. The result will roll the aircraft to the right. If the pilot reverses the aileron deflection, right aileron down, left up, the right wing will lift up and the airplane will roll to the left. The next time you travel in an airplane, you'll know how it works. I hope. All right, so that's a little bit about the preview about what we're going to be moving into and talking about next. Now, this is a wind tunnel. Um, a wind tunnel is where they, they can basically uh, design aircraft. In this case, um, we're going to be talking about the wing. This is a wing right here. And these lines are basically different lines of whatever they use. I think it's like a fog or material that basically allows them to show the engineers um, uh, the different uh, characteristics of how that airfoil will work in flight. Now, uh, we are going to get more into airfoil design in class number two. Uh, so keep that in mind. We'll be talking about it. But I'll point out a couple different things. Um, we always have the front of the wing right here is called the leading edge of the wing. And on the very back side, that is called the trailing edge. OK, so you've got your leading edge in the front and your trailing edge in the back. The other thing I'll also point out uh, is going to be that you're going to see that this air that's basically hitting the leading edge will separate and some of the air starts to go along the top part of the wing and the top part of the wing is called the upper camber, that's C-A-M-B-E-R, and then some of it is split and it goes along the bottom part of the wing, which is called the lower camber, okay? Now, what's kind of interesting here is that if you were to take a string and measure from here to here at the very top part, then that string will be a little bit longer than if we were to measure the bottom part of the wing from here to here because it has this curvature, okay? If you were to measure the bottom part of that wing, it will be just ever so slightly uh, shorter or, or not as long in distance. So. When the air basically splits uh, and at that leading edge, we've got part of it going to the upper portion of the wing and part of it going to the bottom portion of the wing. And as it does that, the air on the upper portion is actually going to speed up. And we're going to talk about why that happens. That is part of uh, Newton's law and then also Bernoulli's principle is, is the primary rule. And then um, that's that's usually what will end up happening so we actually have a lower pressure on the top of that wing because the speed is 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 actually going faster and we have higher pressure on the low on the bottom part of the wing and that's that's what's going to basically create lift at the end of the day okay so we'll go into it in more detail all right so going back to your physics classes i don't know how many people have taken physics so far but with those physics classes, we're going to talk about Newton's three laws. And probably one of the more important ones is going to be that third law down there. But we'll start off at the beginning. Um, so Newton's first law states that every object will remain uniform unless acted upon by an external force. So in this case, the airplane will move when a force is applied to it. So usually that's going to be thrust in that case, right? Or if we were to push it down the runway, if we had a lot of strength, we can push it. Um, Newton's second law is that force equals the mass times the actual acceleration. So the acceleration rate of an object is directly proportional to the applied force and inversely proportional to the mass. So what this means is that the more force that's applied, the faster that we go. So if we throw in 10 more extra engines in terms of thrust, we're going to have some problems engineering wise, but uh, that will allow us to go theoretically faster, okay? Newton's third law is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So uh, in this case, we have thrust. Thrust is what basically pushes that aircraft along, uh, or in, in our case, in, in our aircraft, it's actually pulling us along on the props. And we then have a problem with that. We have P factor, or what we call left-hand turning tendencies. We'll talk a little bit more about those as well. Um, the other thing, uh, it's a very simple principle that uh, whatever you do, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Next, what we're going to talk about is Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle is, is primarily the principle that explains what happens to the air passing over the curved top part of the wing. So Bernoulli uh, developed this device. This is called a Venturi. And you basically have air that enters uh, one way and then exits in the backside there. 
And what you'll notice is that the velocity might be a little bit hard to see, but the first one is velocity and the second one is pressure. Velocity and pressure are basically equal in those circumstances. But as the air enters the Venturi, which is basically a narrowing, what ends up happening is that the velocity speeds up, so the air speeds up and the pressure decreases, right? So remember what I said about the wing. Uh, the wing on the high portion of the wing, remember our velocity is basically increasing and our pressure is decreasing. So when you think about a wing, as the velocity actually moves faster, the pressure is gonna be decreasing. And if you think back to that wing, that's the reason why we have a low pressure on top of the wing and a high pressure on the bottom of the wing. And the air on the top of the wing actually moves faster than the air on the bottom. Uh, and that's also because it, it has to cover a, a longer distance, okay? So looking at it in another way, um, this, is, this is what we were talking about at the very beginning uh, of this section. So we have the leading edge, right? The leading edge of the wing, and we've got the areas from that point where it basically travels along the upper camber, which is the upper portion of the wing, or the lower camber, the bottom portion of the wing. And as you can see here, the distance that the air has to travel on the top portion is actually a little bit further than the distance it has to travel on the bottom portion. So along the bottom of the wing, we have a slower speed, but a higher pressure. And on the top of the wing, we actually, because that air speeds up as per Bernoulli's principle, we get that lower pressure, which then causes lift. And lift is what allows us to fly, okay? So that's kind of putting the whole airplane thing in a nutshell. Engineers can go, they've got obviously a lot more depth than us pilots, right? In terms of equations and numbers and calculus and all sorts of things. Um, and you can ask any more advanced questions uh, like you want to any of those guys. It's been a long time since I've been in math class, folks. Uh, so anyways, the air is going to tend to flow from the high pressure to the low pressure because remember, air is always trying to equalize and that's another reason why we get lift and lift is created, okay? Uh, you guys can also kind of mimic these things, you know, like I said, if you're driving down the, the road or the freeway, stick your hand out. If you start uh, just kind of figuring out, you kind of angle your hand just a little bit uh, upwards, then you'll obviously start to create lift because you're going to have the same principles. And if it's uh, you're going to angle it downwards, you're actually going to start descending that hand. Uh, so go try that the next time you do it. All right. So the next question I have is dealing with Bernoulli. So which statement relates to what we just talked about, Bernoulli's principle? Is it A, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction? B, an additional upward force is generated as the lower surface of the wing deflects air downward? or C, air traveling faster over the curved upper surface of an airfoil causes lower pressure on top of the surface. Right, got a few more people answering. All right, since there was a couple of questions that I saw when I was talking about that hand thing, if you guys are going down the road or the freeway, just stick your hand, your arm out the window, carefully, of course, or next to the edge of the window. And um, if you start to angle your hand up, just like a wing or an airfoil, then what will end up happening is your hand or the, the hand will naturally lift up, right? And if you start to actually angle your hand down, then what will happen is your hand is going to start to go down towards the bottom of that window as well. So um, that's what I meant by kind of trying to create your own little airfoil using your hand. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at the question. So it looks like uh, we've got majority of folks answering and the correct answer here, everybody is going to be C. So remember that uh, A is dealing with a little bit of Newton's law. That's actually Newton's third law of motion. Uh, B is, is also incorrect because that refers to Newton's third law. So basically A and B are dealing with Newton, but the correct answer here is gonna be C. 
Uh, it's air traveling faster over the upper curved, or the, or, I'm sorry, over the curved upper surface of an airfoil, which causes the low pressure on top of the surface. Okay, so air is traveling faster on the upper portion of the wing, which is giving it that lower pressure, and that's basically what uh, creates lift uh, in the most easiest or simplest sense. All right, the next thing we're going to talk about is the four forces, and this is the last thing we're going to be talking about for tonight, so I appreciate everybody's patience out there. Uh, and we, what we're looking at is what actually makes an airplane fly. So we obviously have several different forces that we're fighting against in order to get the airplane to do what we want it to do. The biggest ones that we have are going to be lift and weight, so obviously this is a very heavy aircraft, and these wings, the wings here, are basically designed uh, to basically create enough lift to lift this body up and get this thing in the air, okay? Now, beyond lift and weight, so lift counters weight, then we have thrust. So thrust is, our, our in our case, our propeller or if it's a jet engine. Um, and then obviously what counters thrust is drag, things that kind of slow us down. Think of drag as like a parachute in a way, okay? It's all the little nuts and bolts and things sticking out of the aircraft that actually... Um, cause us to slow down, okay? All right, let's go ahead and continue and we'll look at each one of these uh, briefly and we'll talk a little bit about thrust first. So obviously I think that's uh, Airbus if memory serves me correctly. Um, on this aircraft, we obviously have two jet engines, so, um, but it doesn't really matter. It does not matter. These principles are all the same uh, when we are talking about uh, thrust. So keep this in mind. This is basically uniform discussion. It's all going to be, be the same depending on what airplanes we are talking about. So thrust is the engine or the aircraft engine, which is providing the power. Uh, but keep in mind that on the propellers, it actually has the airfoil shape of a propeller that converts the power into thrust. Okay. The propellers are like mini wings, except the wings in, our, in those cases instead of basically being horizontal like wings, the propeller actually sticks up and down, right? So that propeller will pull that airplane through uh, the air or the environment. Now, thrust is acting parallel to the longitudinal axis. Remember the long axis, if we were to think about an airplane, we the long axis is basically from tip, right? So the very, very front of the airplane where the spinner is, uh, I will call this the spinner right here. And then obviously we have the empennage at the very, very back. Um, I will draw a very crude empennage. So this is the longitudinal axis that we're talking about. So thrust is acting, acting parallel to the longitudinal axis. However, it's not always the case. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in class, okay? All right, so what counters thrust? So thrust obviously is what pushes us through the air or pulls us through the air. And what the opposite of that is, is drag. So drag is the resistance of movement of that aircraft. So kind of think of it as like a parachute, right? It's something that's slowing us down. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's two different basic types of drag. So the first one is called parasite drag, or we also call this parasitic drag. And the next one is known as induced drag. So parasite drag is drag that is not associated with the production of lift. So it increases as the square of the airspeed increases. So what we mean by this is that as we actually start rolling down the runway and we start increasing speed, then parasite drag starts to increase. Now, what creates parasite drag is really going to be things that kind of stick up, right? So anything in that that's basically disturbing the airflow of that aircraft, so like wing struts, nuts, bolts, rivets that stick out, anything that's not smooth is going to be creating parasite drag. So these are just a couple of examples. So as you can imagine, as we go faster and faster and we get more airspeed, our parasite drag starts to actually increase. Okay. Now, induced drag is actually the highest when the airplane is basically sitting still or basically taxing along at low speeds. Induced drag it will actually change inversely or opposite of the airspeed. So what we mean by that is going to be that as we actually increase in speed, our induced drag is actually going to decrease. So if we have an increase of airspeed, we're gonna have an increase uh, parasite drag and we're gonna have a decrease of induced drag, okay? And as we slow down, it's gonna be the opposite of that. So that's what we mean 
and we'll talk a little bit more about angle of attack and how a wing is actually put together in next class, but we're going to briefly also talk about uh, lift as well, okay? Uh, let's see, does the word parasite partially mean that? If so, let's see, parasite drag is a little bit different than what you're talking about. I can give you a way to memorize that here in a bit, okay? So banners on an airplane, that would definitely be a parasitic drag, absolutely. Uh, induced drag is, is basically caused by the same factors that produce lift. So um, that is dealing with more of the air, air foil itself, okay? All right, lift, what's getting us up in the air? We learned a little bit about Bernoulli's principle in terms of the air is obviously flowing faster over the top portion of the wing, and then that is what causes lift. And on the bottom portion of the wing, we have a high pressure system or a high pressure, uh, and that means the air is moving a little bit slower, okay? Now, looking at lift overall, lift is obviously going to be countering uh, at least weight, right? So the weight of the aircraft is, is the thing that's kind of holding us down. And when engineers build these different types of aircraft, they can then compute all the numbers that pilots need in terms of how much can we put in the airplane uh, and how much lift will this airplane actually create and make sure it's safe before they actually release it to the public, okay? So lift is opposing downward force of weight. So it's, it's the opposite of weight. And it's actually pro uh, produced by the dynamic effect of the air acting on the airfoil. So this acts perpendicular to the flight path. Now you'll notice that we're showing you a couple different airfoils here. So an airfoil is just a thing that's called a wing, right? The wing is the thing that makes it fly. Um, this is an airfoil. This is the main part of the actual airplane itself. And then this horizontal stabilizer is actually an airfoil as well, okay? So we've got different portions which are basically acting uh, counter or contrary, and then we've got lift, and lift obviously needs to uh, be greater than weight for us to actually get off the ground, okay? Does that make sense, everyone? You can do cloud surfing, absolutely, as long as you're uh, a certain distance above the clouds, so you have that opportunity once you get your license. It's actually pretty cool, or if you're an instrument pilot, you'll get that opportunity to kind of uh, cut through the clouds um, all the time anyways, okay? All right, let's go ahead and take a look. I uh, don't wanna give you that one, I wanna give you the next one, which is gonna be weight here. Uh, so weight is obviously countering lift, okay? So weight is the combined weight of the aircraft or what we call the load of the aircraft. And this includes everything, right? So this includes the aircraft itself, which is what we call a basic empty weight of the aircraft. It includes the crew itself, yourselves, the fuel, cargo, passengers, baggage, anything that we put inside that actual uh, fuselage is part of the weight. The downward force, and, and remember weight is basically acts straight down. So wherever that aircraft balances, it's pulling it straight down. That's the purpose of gravity. And it's caused by gravity, which is obviously opposing lift and um, it will basically act straight down. So if you were to take a pencil or a pen uh, and you try to balance it on your finger, kind of like we're gonna be talking about here a little bit later, I'm not gonna be able to do it very well, but if you can figure out where that, that pen or pencil actually balances, that's gonna be what is known as the center of gravity, and then all of the weight is actually being pulled down from that point, it's like basically a single point. So lift is actually countering what we're talking about there. Okay, any questions so far? All right, well, that was the very first class. So thank you so much, everybody, for uh, showing up. We'll be sticking around, like always, uh, to answer any questions you may or may not have. Uh, it doesn't have to be directly related to the class, so um, feel free to let us know. Uh, in addition to that, we do also have, I know a lot of people here have talked to either Rebecca or Crystal, so they are both online, happy to answer any questions. And we have IT also here in the chat uh, to answer anything as we go along. So thank you so much, everybody. Hopefully we will see everybody next weekend, which is gonna be Saturday. Uh, this recording will be posted here very shortly once we're done. Um, and.